Hello, courageous people of booktube. My name is Morgan, and I recently finished reading The Push, A Climber's Search for the Path by professional climbing legend Tommy Caldwell, and it was excellent five out of five stars. Not only was his story motivational, inspiring, and incredible, but his writing style is surprisingly refreshing for an athlete talking about his athletics. Much of the book is written in this descriptive and poetic writing style, and he even uses climbing as a metaphor through which to interpret life itself. Tommy Caldwell is also just a really likable narrator. He is humble, passionate, and honest. He is probably best known for his free ascent of this extremely flat rock formation in Yosemite National Park in California in 2015. That rock formation is called El Capitan, and the side of El Capitan that he climbed up was called the Dawn Wall. He tackled this giant feat with his climbing partner, Kevin Jorgensen, and this wall was thought to be totally unclimbable climbable before Tommy put together a path all the way up its side. There is also a documentary on this project called The Dawn Wall, which you should totally watch before you read this book. But even before that, stick around because I have brought in a climbing friend of mine to discuss this book. This book was originally recommended to me by my friend Bren Piper from the YouTube channel Piper Concepts. Me and Bren met in undergrad where he did a degree in engineering and I did a degree in drama. We met though through the juggling community and we have stayed friends ever since even though Bren is now across the country in Banff, Alberta, where he spends his time skiing and rock climbing and ice climbing and all sorts of fun outdoorsy stuff. Since I'm not really a climber yet, I thought that I would bring Bren onto my channel to discuss the push with me. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Bren about the book. Hello again, Bren. Hello again. We're going to talk today about the book the Push by Tommy Caldwell, A Climber's Search for the Path, uh, which you read and loved and then made me read it and I read it and loved. So we're here to talk about it today. And before we actually get into it, can you just like quickly tell us where you are? Because I find it so incredible and exciting. Uh, I can. Physically in the world? <laughs> physically, physically in the world, I am in my bedroom. Uh, <laughs> But where my bedroom is located is I live in uh, Banff, Alberta. Uh, so in the heart of the Rockies and in Banff National Park. I work out here at one of the ski resorts at Sunshine Village. Yeah, I basically, I do IT for the ski hill, you know, so everyone can post their uh, sweet Snapchats and post to their Instagram. Because if you don't do it for the gram, what's the point? And then I get to spend my time, my free time in the winter, a lot of skiing. Uh, this year now, a lot of ice climbing. Um, and then in the summers, it's a lot of rock climbing and a lot of scrambling and a lot of hiking. And, you know, I look out right now and I see uh, Rundle Mountain, one of the larger mountains uh, surrounding the town of Banff. So that's basically where I am. I'm basically in climber's paradise. We'll have to stick in some photos over the video so people can see the beauty of where you are. So let's talk about the book now. My first question for you is what initially drew you to this book? Obviously you're a climber, but um, maybe like once you started reading, what made you keep reading? Quite frankly, the, the initial reason I bought it was I bought it right when the pandemic started and I needed something to read, um, but also something that would keep me motivated for climbing because um, I definitely had a lot of climbing goals in mind for the summer given, you know, it was pretty much exactly a year ago uh, that I was driving from Banff back to Ontario uh, when the pandemic hit because I lost my job. So I wanted to keep that motivation up and watching the Dawn Wall documentary, I've watched it a dozen, couple dozen, maybe times. It was something that had given me that motivation. And it was always just a film I knew I could go back to, to watch, to feel good and feel pumped for climbing as it were. So that's really why I bought it was just I wanted to learn more about Tommy and his life and his skill set, just kind of have that that drive that he had. Um, and then as I was reading it, it just I mean, it kept going on that. I mean, the guy, you know, he worked on the Donwall for seven years. He was uh, kidnapped 
in Kyrgyzstan and held captive for a week uh, along with three other climbers, including his at the time girlfriend, Beth. He pushed the final captor off a cliff for them to be able to escape and survive. There was just so much in his life that and his childhood too, I should say as well, like his childhood growing up and his experiences in school and with other kids and things like that. And just his, his way of going through life just really attracted me, I guess, uh, and kept me hooked. And it just kind of, it kept me reading through the whole thing. Whereas the documentary focuses so much on the climb. He really focuses in this book on his life. And then the Dawn Wall is just kind of a result of that. So as I was reading as well, um, I, I definitely was finding my own energy feeding off of his drive and getting inspired and motivated to go put in the work at Physical Pursuits as well. Uh, it was like a huge motivator for me when I read it, which you know was recently, so a year into the pandemic and needing that extra boost of motivation. Uh, this book definitely gave me that push um, and that drive to go out and run more because I'm not a rock climber. I'd love to get into rock climbing once I can get into a gym. Um, you know, once this pandemic is over, because I'm not out in the Rockies. Uh, But I'm a runner. And this book even gave me motivation for running. He runs a little bit in the book, of course, but even just his approach to rock climbing and getting up at three in the morning so that he can start his climb, you know, at four and the amount of drive and motivation he had to keep going, no matter what was happening in his life, definitely kept me reading and uh, kept me running and like had a positive impact on my life elsewhere. (laughs) His motivation is infectious because it's so, for him, it just is. He was never like having to force himself necessarily to be motivated, I would say. You know, he was trying to maybe at times avoid other thoughts or whatever, but his motivation from a young age is just clearly so intrinsic and built into the way he goes through life that it was just, well, yeah, I just put eight hours a day into training for this climb. It just was, that's what I did. And it's, it's infectious to see how normal it is for him, I guess. And it wants, it makes you want to have that same feeling. That was one of the points too, that I think I messaged you while reading that I was like, I cannot believe how much time he puts into training because he, he, you know, it's not detailed, but he goes into a bit the hours that he spends training. And like, sometimes it's, you know, 16 hours a day training. You were speaking about this intrinsic motivation from a young age. And one of the passages that sticks out to me so strongly in my memory is when he, as a, a young child, I think he was like elementary school, there's this competition in his school for who can run the most kilometers or miles, I guess, probably, um, you know, in the summer, I think something like this or throughout the year. It was a, it was an athletic competition and all the other kids, you know, they ran maybe it was like 500 miles or something in the whole year. And he did like over double what any other child did because he was just so motivated. He had such drive. And then they didn't give him the prize because they didn't believe he could even do that amount of miles. And that just made me so upset that our school system is demotivating these children that are so highly motivated in areas that aren't just academics. So that really, that hit me in a spot as somebody who's passionate about the education system. Um, So there's so much in this book that isn't just about rock climbing. And his family, I mean, his dad was a power lift bodybuilder rather and a rock climbing guide and a rock climber. So his whole childhood was climbing as well and skiing and things like that. It wasn't even that they didn't give it to him. He just went, yeah, this makes sense that they don't believe me and it's whatever and just didn't mention it to anyone. Like didn't say, didn't speak up, didn't say anything. And he wasn't a classroom learner. He talks about it a lot in the book and they never tried to tailor his learning to anything but that. And, you know, when he had that motivation for that award, they took it away from him because they just were like, no, that's not possible. But it was. Yeah. Um, that, That whole, like, they didn't believe it was possible but he did it is kind of a theme throughout his whole life, I think, with losing his finger and still being able to climb the hardest climbs uh, ever and and um, the Dawn Wall, which everybody thought was completely impossible, and then he free climbed the whole thing. Um, so that kind of is an, an underlying 
message of this book and of his life that's like something is only impossible until you do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, he had it when he cut off his finger. He says he had a doctor come in and say that I guess was a climber and said, well, you got to find a new profession now. And it was kind of like a, well, a few yeah. moment of, no, I don't <laughs> like, I'm going to keep doing this. This is, this is what my life is. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure it out. You also mentioned, um, and something that I found inspiring about the book, his, um, his approach to people not believing in him, I guess he was, it was, it's not, it was, it's not acceptance, but he, he just, that's fine. Like he doesn't need them to believe in him for him to do this thing. Uh, and to know that he has done this thing. And he did a lot of uh, competition climbing. I don't know all the terms. He does a lot of competition climbing because, you know, he needs that to make money and whatnot, but he doesn't necessarily like it. Like he's not in it for the validation, the external validation of, of prize money or, you know, getting first place. And the first time he ever competes, it's, it's like the most humble thing ever. He's almost embarrassed that he won, you know? And in the book, he barely talks about that win at all because that's not the focus for him. His focus in this book is being with nature, is determination, is uh, his love for his family and friends and partner and then children. Uh, and I love that. It was beautiful. Yeah. So that was Snowbird. He basically did a citizen's competition before the major one. And that was really one of the first big sport climbing competitions to ever happen. And he won the citizens competition, which he thought they screwed up in setting the routes because it was too easy for him because he topped all four of the routes or however many routes they had. And he was like, well, that was too easy. This is, this competition's over. Like I clearly failed it. And then he was told, no, you were the only person to top all four routes. And then they offered him to go into the main competition. When you're doing the competitions, you don't see the other climbers going. And so he went out and topped it. And then figured, well, like, well, if I topped it, everyone else is topping it and they're going to do it way faster than me. And he was the only person to top it, to top the route, beating all these professional climbers that have been climbing for so long. And I think he was around 14 at that point. And it was just kind of like, oh, okay, I won. Cool. And came very famous, very fast in climbing, did years of sport competition, which like you said, he doesn't really talk about in the book, but he he competed on the world system for several years, but big wall climbing and outdoor climbing was really where it was for him. There's not competition for that. That just is climbing. You just kind of live that life. And it's, it's a juxtaposition. Yeah. Of he very clearly needs, you know, people in his life. Like he relies on his friendships and his love for people and love from people a lot. But then his pursuits are also very singularly focused and very driven just by his own mind and just within himself and being alone for that climb. And he talks about not liking having the camera crew with him doing the dawn wall because it doesn't feel right to have that, you know, a whole camera crew with you and a whole system set up and then the news and the media circus that followed the climb as people kind of heard, started hearing about it. Let's move on now then to, I guess, the core message that you get from this book and what's most important about this book for you personally. And I'll just say for, for me, it, it was this importance that you just mentioned of having friends and family around, um, even though he's doing a solo sport. And at times he asks himself, why am I doing this? And like, am I so selfish that I spend all my time by myself doing the thing that I love? and, you know, neglect my, my relationships and, you know, other life things. But in the end, like rock climbing, as much as it's technically solo, you can't help somebody on the rock climbing. Eh, that's not entirely true because when you've got a partner up there, or you've got people down on the ground, they're cheering you on. And, and that support, that emotional and support is actually assisting you being able to push onward. And that was very clear in all of his stories, that it was the social connections that he had that helped push his physical technique and, and ability. Also, like the, the fact that when you do something big, like the Don Wall Project, it seems maybe at face value selfish, 
but he was very much doing it for all those people down on the ground watching him. You know, we do get something out of seeing another person fulfill their dreams, and we're talking about how we get so motivated by the fact that he's so motivated. So him being motivated to do something that might seem selfish, I think, is actually a really communal um, thing because it inspires all of us. So what what do what's your what do you get out of this book? What's your core message or takeaway? It's a lot of the same, I, honestly, that you just said. Um, it's a lot of having that uh, both that built in motivation on the climbing side of it, but then on the personal life side of it, it really is that motivation of realizing all the people around you, how they help you, and how much you you need them without realizing you need them as much as you know you can think you're a introvert or a solo person you have these people around you and that drives you further forward like i remember a a year and a half ago a friend was doing one of those quizzes of what of this are you what disney character are you or something like like that kind of thing and she was filling it out for me and she asked and the one of the questions was basically like do you prefer being alone or with people And I went, oh, alone. And she just looked at me and went like, no, you need people. And it was like, oh, because just in my mind and like thinking about it more. And again, with reading this book, like it made me think of that moment where it's like a lot of my aspirations or goals or whatever feel personal and they feel singular and like I'm doing them on my own. But really all the people around you, uh, your friends, your partners, your housemates, uh, your family push you forward. They give you that confidence and that want and that drive. And they give you that interaction that helps push you. They give you that, you know, they're not explicitly a crowd at a sport game cheering you on, but they're cheering you on in the other ways that they're just there for you. Um, And I think the book really helped open my eyes to that more. And help me understand that, you know, that even though, you know, a climb, you're doing it on your own, you have someone below you belaying you the whole way up and you, that's your family, that's your friends, that's the people in your life doing that for you. Um, So speaking of this, this comparison between life and climbing, because we're talking, we're talking a lot about climbing, uh, motivation for, for physical pursuits, motivation to reach our goals, but also like, you know, our support in life and these things cross over but in his actual writing style they become metaphors for each other and this is what i absolutely loved about the writing of this book because you know his story is great but i do love me a good piece of writing and i was actually super impressed by the writing in this book the way that he uses rock climbing as a metaphor for life and especially his social relationships he he does this thing at the beginning of each chapter where he writes for about a page and a half in italics, and he will describe in detail using poetic language and descriptive imagery um, the crux moment, I want to say, of the chapter, right? So like the most challenging moment that's going to be in the chapter, he introduces it in this really poetic language, which I thought was a beautiful metaphor for like literally demonstrating how the chapter of a book is like a pitch in a larger climb, which is the book. And he directly makes that comparison between writing a book and climbing the Dawn Wall at the end of this book. Um, But also he will use climbing terms to describe life moments, like we were at the crux of our relationship. So that's what pushed this for me to be an excellent book as opposed to just a a memoir that's you know on average level is there anything but the writing style itself that drew you to this book climbing outside of sport climbing you're, you're always seeking sponsorships to be able to do it for a living is really hard and he was right he wrote articles about his expeditions that he would do and stuff like that for climbing magazines And for different publications. And that's part of how he made a living, these different, you know, articles for stuff. So he definitely had writing experience before writing this book. And it shows there's, you know, there's other biographies out there um, or memoirs that are, you can kind of tell they haven't really written before. (laughs) I think part of it is that he isn't pandering to the audience. It's written, you know, that I can understand it and that I can really enjoy it. And I can really enjoy the climbing side of it because I know the climbing side of it. And then also gain a lot on the life side from it. 
but then it's also written such that you as a person who has never climbed before can also understand it and can gain a lot from it and can really appreciate you know what he was doing and what he was going for when he was doing the climb and it started to become a media circus people were all of a sudden going like oh like get this pitch get pitch 15 pitch 15 was like their big one they couldn't get people that didn't know climbing at all were going pitch 15 and it's like you know it just it seeps into you it's a sport that again is singular so like you know if i took you to a climbing gym i might climb something that's in the 510 range or something like that 511 is where it's going to get hard for me and i'm going to be projecting a route if i get to the top of it it's this big celebration it's this big goal and it feels really good and everyone else is really happy for me if you know someone that's their f- first few times to the gym i'm bringing someone brand new and they climb a 5 8 that is also amazing like and they feel so good when they get to the top everyone trying climbing has their own goals and you get that same burst of energy and that same great feeling at your own level and everyone has that same excitement for each other at each other's own at accomplishing your own level and i think he brings that feeling into the writing of the book that you can understand it and easily apply it to your own goals and your own systems That was another thing I appreciate about the writing of this book is he's telling his own story, but at the same time, he's telling the history of climbing through his own story. And he's teaching you about climbing so that I could stick with him, even though I'm not a climber. What you were just saying, um, no matter which level you're at at climbing, it's impressive for you to have done the climb at the level that you're at. We all congratulate you and we we are happy for you for having done that climb. and, And it's infectious, this love of climbing. I think that that is very similar to the experience of juggling and getting people into juggling. And I just want to bring that up because we're both jugglers. We met through the juggling community and um, I found that some of the things he was describing in this book remind me of some of the things I think about while I'm juggling. For instance, he talks about cerebral athleticism, which I find juggling is also a very cerebral physical activity because you're you're really like thinking hard about what you're doing as you're doing it like it really is a mind and body collapsed together sort of experience um and you can get into the flow state of juggling which i assume you can do with rock climbing as well he certainly seemed to be in a a flow type state as he was doing some of those pitches on the dawn wall there's also this quote near the beginning of the book where he says, in how many other areas in life do you get to test yourself over and over and over? How many other endeavors give you such immediate feedback? And I immediately thought of juggling because it's the same thing. Like you throw them all up and they drop and you throw them all up and they drop and you try over and over and over this one thing until you get it. And then we all celebrate you. So did you have a similar vibe as also a juggler while reading the book? I think so, yeah. Teaching people to juggle when they can finally get seven catches with three balls is so exciting. And hitting seven balls for someone higher up is so exciting in the exact same way. And rock climbing is the exact same feeling. Like you get to the top of a climb and that, you know, relief that kind of comes over you and that just like energy that you feel is just such an addictive feeling and just feels so good to just kind of flow through a route right and just be with the rock and be in the system it's all precise movements of especially like and i'm trying to remember the numbers for juggling but with five ball if like your throws off by a couple degrees it can change the landing by 30 40 50 centimeters climbing if you if you grab a hold slightly wrong like a couple centimeters off from that perfect grip spot you're gonna fall off and it's just having that precision when you can hit that and when you can understand it and recognize it that that there's a there's a lot of crossover in it i think learning can to juggle can help you rock climb and i think rock climbing can help you juggle you have a you have an awareness of your body i know i've found it in other sports that my hand eye coordination thanks to juggling is way higher um and more applicable 
And I think that does cross over to juggling of just naturally knowing where your body is and how your body's moving. That's a really good point. Like literally just using your hands and body to manipulate objects that are external to you or manipulate yourself around those objects in the case of climbing. Anyway, th this book, so clearly it does, it can relate to so many different aspects of life and sport and athleticism and, you know, thinking and learning as well. Thank you so much for introducing me to this book and putting this awesome book into my life. Uh, clearly I bought it, so I enjoyed it enough that I wanted the physical copy on my shelf. You can see all the little notes that are sticking out there. Before we go, is there anything, anything you wanted to add about the book? Read it. Read it, and I think watch the documentary. I, I told you to, it's on Netflix for everyone. The Dawn Wall is what it's called. Give it a watch first. That's what I told you to do is watch the documentary first, then read the book. It's not causing spoilers. You actually get to learn a bit about him and the stuff that happened in his life. And then the book just expands on it so much more and touches on everything different. So I think read the book, but also watch the documentary and do the documentary first. <laughs> and then spread out from there to other climbing stuff. There are amazing films out there for climbing. That is a whole other video we could do on just climbing content. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bren, for coming onto my channel to have a conversation with me about this book. If you watching have not yet read this book, then I encourage you to do so. And if you have already read this book, give me a comment and tell me what your favorite part about the book or Tommy's life or the documentary was. And if you have any recommendations of books that I should read, please feel free to drop them in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and I will see you in the next video.